morning. Pleasure to welcome you to worship today on this Heat Advisory Sunday. Um, I welcome you, I draw your attention to announcements in the bulletin, birthdays and anniversaries. Uh, some good news I'll mention without mentioning last name since this is being broadcast, but uh, Bev is home uh, from the hospital. We're delighted to hear that, uh, but we're delighted that, that Jessie is home from the care facility that she has been at uh, for quite some time. So she came home on uh, Friday, so she still needs our attention and prayers and uh, perhaps an occasional visit. Just to keep in touch with uh, unusual twists on the calendar, uh, next Sunday is the fifth Sunday of the month, so that is the two cents a meal Sunday. So this is your, your official heads up uh, to be prepared for that special offering next week. Let's uh, still our hearts, um, assume an attitude of expectation, and prepare for worship. Let us join together in the responsive call to worship. We have gathered in this place to worship. Jesus invites us to come. We come as we are, with our faith and our doubts, with our successes and our failures, because Jesus invites us to come. We have come with what we have, bringing with us the events and experiences of this past week because Jesus invites us to come. Let us pray. Rock of Israel and cornerstone of our common life, you are not bound by our visions, our structures, our doctrine. We cannot predict your coming or going, yet you have given us your story, your family, your work to do. Meet us here. Shape us for service in your world, for we carry the name of Jesus and live by the power of your breath. Amen. Let us join together and stand, if you are able, in our hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.
Sisters and brothers, all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. We did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but we have received a spirit of adoption. Let us then confess our failings with the freedom of children who know how deeply they are loved. Join me in a prayer for wholeness. Merciful God, your creatures cry, creation groan, but we turn away. We surround ourselves with noise. We are quick to excuse ourselves from responsibility. We are young, we are old, we are tired, we are busy. It is hard to imagine that we might make a difference. Life-giving God, wash us clean. Restore our imaginations and our hearts. Let your courage and compassion flow through our veins until we love with abandon and our hands reach out in blessing. For the creation of witness and eager longing, for the revealing of the children of God. Amen. Sisters and brothers, hear the word of the Lord. In life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, God says unequivocally, irrevocably, you are my own. You are forgiven. And I need you to be about my business in the world. Let's join together in the song response. Could you come join me? Have you gotten taller? I think maybe so, maybe so. I just want to see how you are doing because so often we have an idea that when we come to church, you know, just people tell us what to believe and tell us what to think. And so I just want to find out, how are you doing today? You're good? What what have you been up to these past couple of weeks? Lido, okay. Okay, wearing sunscreen. Yes, good, good. Well, I just want you to remember that part of church is coming together with community, and this is a place where we can be relaxed and be ourselves and come with our questions. Uh, A lot of people are afraid to come to church because they think they're just going to get stuff forced down their throats and tell them what to believe, but we're interested in you. And we want you to remember that, especially as you get older, that this is a church that wants to know how you think and how you're feeling and what makes you happy and what makes you sad. Can you remember that? Please do, please do. (laughs) Would you have a word of prayer with me? Lord, we thank you for Adeline, um, and we pray that this might be a church where she can grow and learn more about you But most important, she could be free to ask questions, uh, free to say what's on her mind, free to be real, and not have to put on a a special act to come and be accepted here. Uh, Help us, on the other hand, as a church, to love her, uh, accept her for who she is. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
Will you join me for our prayers of intercession? Gracious creator, sower of life, you know the complicated histories that have carried us to this moment. You know the names of all our generations, for you are there in each story of falling away and turning home. In our long years of wandering and in our shining moments, when we recognize your presence and find the grace to worship you, you are no stranger to the striving or the listlessness of humanity. Incarnate one, all of creation is groaning with a warming planet, and so we dare to ask that you would come to us to be born again in this place, in the midst of our boredom, our self-congratulations, our closeted vision. Startle us with the tearing, the cry, the first breath of life that will not be restrained. Strengthen in us the fruits of your spirit and teach us to pray. We pray for all who, like Jacob, flee from pasts by which they are haunted. We lift up all who feel abandoned by a future for which they had hoped. We plead for all who do not know that they are loved and chosen. We intercede for our own divided souls. Help us to trust that you are at work in every mingled heart, every conflicted community. Nourish the life that you plant within us, that we might keep seeding the word with your truth and your grace. In the name of Jesus, who gave his life out of love for the world, we pray. Amen. God blesses us so that we might carry his blessings out into the world. Let us give with joyful and open hearts as we receive our morning offering.
Let us pray. God of mystery and grace, you have met us and blessed us with such abundant promise. In gratitude, we offer what we carry in our hearts and in our pockets as we bring these worn and freighted offerings. We pray that you would use us, for we come in the name of Jesus and by the movement of your spirit in this place. Amen. Well, is it good to be flexible? Um, I got inspired to switch things up here a little bit. Uh, in your bulletin, that refers to a poem that's coming next. I thought that was just too perfect, and so I am moving that to after the sermon, and the Declaration of Faith after the sermon, I am moving up right now. So look on the screen, I hope, or in your bulletin. Uh, this is part of a declaration that we've been doing over the past few weeks that we've been in Genesis uh, that helps us uh, frame some of what we've been reading in the scriptures uh, theologically. Uh, so join with me. God delivered his people. When Abraham's descendants were slaves in Egypt, God heard their cries and prayers. God remembered his promise and sent Moses to free them from bondage. We declare God's steadfast love and sovereign power. The Lord can be trusted to keep his promises. The Lord still acts in the affairs of individuals and nations to set the oppressed and people free. Let us join together in our next hymn, Be Thou Our Vision. Our reading is from Genesis chapter 28, uh, verses 10 through the beginning of verse 19, a continuation of the story that we were involved in last week. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night 
because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it, and he called that place Bethel. Would you pray with me? Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. And take our hearts and set them on fire with a love for you. Amen. Well, we're continuing in our series entitled Awkward Family Stories. At this point, I don't think I'm going to take the time to review everything that we've discussed so far. But suffice it to say that we're looking at these stories with a level of depth and honesty that might not be appropriate for a child's Sunday school class. We need to be clear, however, that I make no apologies for the awkward nature of these stories. If anything, we need to be reminded and encouraged to know that God works through awkward family stories just like ours. You know, on the surface, you might initially think this falls into the, the less awkward category. I mean, we're, we're referencing a song that's well known to all of us. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. But we really cannot appreciate this text without recalling the direct connection to the truly awkward story that we spoke about last week. Jacob, the son of Isaac and the grandson of Abraham, was fleeing from his twin brother Esau, who had just vowed to kill him. Esau was furious with Jacob because Jacob had stolen Esau's birthright, the Jewish claim to inheritance and blessing. The mother who had loved him dearly urged him to flee. And while you may not put this together, he was never to see his mother again. She was never to see her son again. Jacob's grasping for status within the family resulted in danger and separation. So then Jacob really is portrayed here as a fugitive, fleeing, fleeing his life, kind of a vagabond somewhere in between a, a conflict-ridden past and a, and a very uncertain future. So then it is exactly at this point, this point of limbo, 
being landless and rootless and with no real prospects for the future, that God meets Jacob at a place of of no particular significance. Jacob's stopping at this point was not part of any particular plan he had. He didn't have a goal to travel so far that day. He didn't have a plan to go camping under his favorite tree. His reason for stopping there was no more strategic than the fact that the sun went down. We read there, quote, He stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Simply making do with what he had. We read that, quote, Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head, and lay down in that place and went to sleep. It tells you something about how exhausted he was when a stone was a suitable substitute for a pillow. So admit this fervent activity of a man on the run, Jacob has a dream. In verse 12, we read that he dreams of a ladder that reaches to heaven with angels of God going up and down upon it. Now, with all due respect to the song, one should probably not think of a ladder in the contemporary sense that we imagine a ladder to be, but but rather it was probably something more like a Mesopotamian ziggurat, a kind of a ramp-like structure that served as a means by which heaven and earth were created. The stairway to heaven does not give Jacob access to heaven. Rather, God speaks to Jacob where he is, sort of denoting God's imminent presence rather than a faraway God calling him from a distance. But it is significant that this surprise encounter completely comes from God breaking into Jacob's state of sleep. It might also be helpful to reflect here for a little bit about what was not said by God. God did not start off saying, well, I have a little something to share with you, but before we get into that, let me take advantage of this opportunity to remind you of how you really blew it with your family. You couldn't trust me to work things out for you? You really had to stoop to deceiving your own father? Now look at the mess you're in. So God did not start this way. He didn't start by laying a guilt trip on him. It would seem that so often we do a good enough job ourselves, feeling guilty all by ourselves, that it may not always be necessary for God to add to the mix. Now, I would like to suggest here that he gave something even more valuable God conveyed to Jacob a sense of his presence and and a sense of of heavily engagement with the affairs of the earth. So with all due respect for the song, it really wasn't Jacob's ladder. It was God's ladder. And at no point was Jacob himself ever climbing the ladder. He was just observing God's engagement with his creation, God's own messengers ascending and descending, symbolizing their role in working out God's plans and purposes. And then something even more significant. He had heard about God's direct involvement in the lives of Abraham and Isaac, but what about him? Was he left on his own devices to 
execute the plan of the covenant? You might conclude that that's what he could have thought. But now the time of hearsay is over, for now we have God speaking directly to Jacob and saying, quote, I am the Lord, the God, the God of, of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac. And now, by golly, get this, I am your God as well. I know you're feeling at your most vulnerable right now, but know that I am with you wherever you go. You know, when you have that kind of assurance and you kind of get it in your gut. You know, any of the details, they're not that important. You know the presence of God. Dreams, what, what do you make of them? There are several dreams that are related throughout Scripture that are viewed with the utmost of importance. That mention elsewhere is made of people who have the, the gift of interpretation of dreams. Just as a footnote here, you should know that dreams are something that I've come to take seriously in my own life. I, I was first exposed to the teachings of Carl Jung, the, the founder of depth psychology, when I was in college, but have been reading quite a bit of this school of thought, particularly over the last 10 years. I was previously a member of the, the Young Society of Washington, D.C., and Personally, I sought out uh, working with a Jungian analyst for a couple of years that was very important to me. It seems that most people don't take their dream life too seriously these days and view their dreams mostly as a byproduct of too much greasy food. But it's also clear to me that so many people put so much energy into staying on the surface of life that they effectively suppress the still, small voice of God within. I believe that God longs to speak with us, but it often isn't until our defenses are lowered that his voice can break through to us. And so often it is in symbolic language as we have here today, with, with the image of a ladder extending to the heavens. And usually dreams are not about giving specific instructions, like move to Montana and raise llamas, but more about having your own powerful experience of the presence of God, like Jacob did. So when you experience God's presence in this way, it, it changes you. It, it stays with you as it has stayed with me. And so it was with Jacob. When Jacob awoke from his dream, his circumstances had not changed, but he was a changed man. His circumstances had not changed. But he was a changed man. I cannot overstate the importance of his words when he says, quote, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And isn't that the truth? God was in the place all along, yet Jacob was so caught up in the outward drama of his life that he just was not able to perceive it. Can any of you relate to that? Are you so overwhelmed by the myriad of details in the drama of your life that you just can't sense God's presence? Maybe sometimes just when our defenses are sufficiently lowered when we hit rock bottom, that we get a gift of vision, a vision that seems more real than the reality of what's going on around us. And our, our soul is transformed simply by an awareness 
of God's presence. Yeah, and really, there's nothing about this passage that's intended to be funny, but there, there's something here that struck me as funny. Jacob is way out there, absolutely in the middle of nowhere, and in the midst of his suffering, he has this transforming experience of God, and what does he do? He sets up a little monument, which over time grew into a famous sanctuary, which over time evolved into an important city. You see what's happening? We make a powerful discovery that God is in this place, and then we start to think, well, there's something significant about this place. This place itself, and we limit God to a place when the truly powerful revelation should be that God is amazingly in every place at every time. It's kind of a funny thing about human nature. We have an experience of God and we put up a monument and we build a a wall around it and, and sell tickets for people to come and visit the spot. We love to build buildings and we try to capture the essence of God in a building so we can visit God at our convenience. Yet in the very midst of our good intentions, we may actually be doing a disservice to our fellow seekers when we invite them to visit the God of a place. We might inadvertently make it harder for people to discover the God of every place, the God of every moment. The awesome, powerful, loving presence of the living God is trying to break into our awareness right now. But but we construct so many barriers in our conscious world that most of us find a hard time to see that. Maybe when you sleep and your, your conscious mind is shut off, God might surprise you by speaking to your unconscious mind. Maybe when you hit rock bottom and your illusions are shattered, you'll discover that the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Maybe when you were away from home on a missions trip, and and you think you're going to share the good news with someone else, that you start hearing the good news to yourself, as you've never heard it before. What's your Bethel dream? Have you had a low point in your life when you felt like all you had was a stone for a pillow? Yet in that low point, you discovered, like me, an, an uncanny sense of God's presence that beyond simply affirming with your lips that you serve the God of Abraham and Isaac, that you might grasp that in your heart, as as Jacob finally did, that you are a child of the covenant. You. The Lord has had a claim on your life all along, and you just didn't know it. When you have been gripped so, don't try to build a wall around that spot, for you could never build a a circle big enough to contain that presence. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Amen. And now let me share that poem with you, which I don't think was written with Jacob in mind, but is reflective of a a larger truth. It's entitled, Everything Has a Deep Dream, by Meg Wheatley. I've spent many years learning how to fix life, only to discover at the end of the day that life is not broken, There is a hidden seed of greater wholeness 
in everyone and everything. We serve life best when we water it and befriend it, when we listen before we act. In befriending life, we do not make things happen according to our design. We uncover something that is already happening in us and around us and create conditions that enable it. Everything is moving towards its place of wholeness, always struggling against the odds. Everything has a deep dream of its self and its fulfillment. Now, if you'll join me in our closing hymn, Joyful is the Dark, I'm, I'm told that this might be a new hymn for you. So, repeat to yourself, I enjoy learning new hymns. I love this hymn, and I want you to, it, it has some very a poignant message. So it, join in. The tune is simple enough. If you need the choir to get you kick-started. <laughs> have a new favorite hymn in your dark. Sisters and brother, however dark the night gets, whatever you have stolen or squandered, know that you are held by a love like this. The creator who made you still claims you in covenant love. The redeemer who died for you for your sake lives again by the word of God. 
the sustainer of all creation, yet breathes courage into your heart. Sisters and brothers, the triune God still traffics in mercy. Serve then with boldness and joy.